Let's pray together. Thanks, dear Lord, for the privilege to be in chapel after all this time to finally be here together. Don't let us take it for granted. Don't let us not use this well. Speak to us and say something to us today. In your name we ask it. Amen. Today, you hopefully, we're to get your attendance recorded instead of standing in the lines and do it on this little app and the instructions were fairly clear. Hopefully how to do it. I think the challenge is you got to download it before you get in the building. That's where we're getting in trouble. But, but uh, chapel really only has three requirements. And uh, one is that you're here <coughs> t- uh, eight out of the ten times we have chapel. And the second is that you are quiet, so don't be whispering to your neighbor or whatever, or be disrespectful. That's the third. You know, if you hold up a book or whatever and, uh, and uh, you're disrespectful, then somebody's going to tap you on the shoulder at the in and say, you know, you were here, but you're not going to get credit because you weren't uh, engaged. And so uh, that, that's the only requirement for chapel. And then you get credit for this class and it's required for graduation. But I hope chapel's a lot more than that to you. I hope chapel really is a time where you can stop the busyness of college life and to really focus on something God might say to you during this time we're together through the music, through some of these interviews and discussions, through the message, however it might be, and in prayer. So, you know, if you had done the thing today and and it had worked properly, it wouldn't be that uh, for you to get credit or not get credit, you had to be smarter than anybody else in the room. That's not how it worked. Uh, because uh, we got all kinds of IQs in this room, and anybody could have done it. It wasn't that you would have been more experienced, that you had more uh, experience with uh, technology or whatever that you would have got it. No, anybody could have done it because it's fairly simple. Simply, it would have been that you were wise, that you followed the instructions, and then you actually did it, and then you got credit. But if it had worked again, and you read the instructions, and you didn't do it, It'd be pretty, pretty few, foolish, really, to, to be here, to have the instruction in front of you and not do what it says. You know, it wouldn't be that you're stupid because it's not a matter of how much brain power you got, whether or not to do it. It wouldn't be that you're incapable because everybody's capable of doing what we have once we get the technology working. It'd just be that you were foolish to have the instruction, could have gotten the reward for it, and didn't because you didn't follow through and actually do it. And that's the message that Jesus is giving us in our verse of the year <clears throat> when he says, excuse me if I got to push the button right here. There we go. I think. There we go. Anyone who listens and follows uh, is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And that is the capstone Jesus gives for the Sermon on the Mount. Now the Sermon on the Mount is kind of the cliff notes of the Bible. This is where we take almost everything Jesus teaches us, and he kind of, in a, in a really succinct form, gives it to us in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And, and I'm looking forward to, I think we're going to have it scheduled the first chapel of the spring semester to have a dramatic reading of the whole Sermon on the Mount as our message for that day. And, and, and to hear those words and how the people would have heard them during those times. But as we look at this teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus then encapsulates the whole message of all this stuff he's talked about in an image, in, a, in something we can see in our, in, a, in our mental picture. And Jesus does that a lot. You know, he always teaching through stories. It's always a parable. Somebody went here, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Or, or he often says it's like this, to try to give us an image so that we can understand it. And, of course, when he was teaching, that was a very oral, it was totally an, almost an oral culture. People didn't write stuff down. They didn't have books they would take with them. And so they had to be able to remember what he said, and so he would give these images to help people remember. And the image he gives for encapsulating all of his teaching is you've got to be wise like somebody who builds their house on the rock, not foolish by somebody who builds on sand. And everybody who would have heard him, they wouldn't have been surprised by that. That wouldn't have been an aha moment because of course you don't build on sand. That's obvious. Everybody in the Middle East knows that. If you build on sand and the and the storms come, your house isn't going to stand up. They all knew that you had to build on rock. And so Jesus gives us kind of this summary that is a lesson in itself that I'm going to tell you how life ought to be lived, but it doesn't do any good if you don't do it. You've got to follow through and actually 
do it, he says. And so we're going to look at that in this Sermon on the Mount. Now the scripture, if you take the whole thing, it reads like this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. And then it goes on. But if anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is foolish, like a person who builds on a house on the sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. A mighty crash. I want to give you four takeaways from this that hopefully will be helpful and they will make all the difference in whether or not your life is solid or your life will eventually hit a mighty collapse. The first is this. God is the architect of a fulfilling life. God is the architect of the life that we are to live. He designed us. He designed the world. He designed the structure of how our relationships are to be in the way that he knows it's going to be fulfilling and solid. And when we do it his way, life works. And when we don't do it his way, we have trouble. Yesterday, I walked through the, the building at the new stadium uh, building that we're building to, to, for the media and the coaches and all that stuff for football and soccer. And, and the architect was there, and the builder was there, and the coaches were there, uh, the head of athletics, and, and all, all the people who were part of this thing were there. And, and just as I got to them, they were down working on something in the ground, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, he said we've got an electrical box in, the, in those little patios we built where I hope you can set up some stuff during games and stuff and have some events. In the electrical box, and he said, there's water in it. The architect said, that's not how I designed it. The builder said, yeah, but I thought it'd be better if we built it this way. The architect said, that's not how I designed it. It's not how it's supposed to work. You see, you can build it however you think is better than the way the architect designed it. But if the architect is God, God did it perfectly. And when you modify that or change it or do it your way instead, bad things are going to happen. It's just a matter of of fact. In fact, Jesus uses this image of the, of the um, uh, uh, rock and the house uh, in, in such a way to let us know that his laws are critical. But look at the kinds of things he's talking about, and then we're going to talk about that. The next thing, thing he talks about all these things in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to cover these during this academic year as we talk through the Sermon on the Mount. And it goes all the way from grace to hypocrisy to money to integrity to, to marriage to religion to, to uh, uh, self-righteousness. All these things Jesus talks about. These are the things he's saying. If you do these things the way I tell you to do them, you're wise. And if you don't, you're going to crash. So that leads us to the second takeaway from this Scripture, and that's that God's laws are just as unbending as nature's laws. And that's why he uses this image of a house and the storms. Because anybody in that time would have known you build a house on sand, the storms come, it's eventually going to collapse. In the same way, you can build your life how you think it ought to be and not build on the rock, and it will eventually collapse. Where if you build on the rock, it will stand. And many of you uh, come from the coast and have been through hurricanes, and I've been through hurricanes, and they are not fun. Hurricanes are, are, are really exciting when you're getting ready for them, and they're really horrible when they come. Really, really horrible. But there are three things that come in hurricanes. You have the wind that comes, and your house has to be able to stand up to a 70, 80, 90 mile an hour wind, and not just that wind, but everything it picks up and blows at your house. You know, a two by four, it picks up from a from off of somebody else's deck and blows at your house at 80 miles an hour is going to do an awful lot of damage. They're going to kill somebody. So you're dealing with the wind. Then you're dealing with the rain. Not the gentle rain we had today that kind of fell on you when you came to chapel as bad as it was. The first group had it tougher than you did because uh, they got a real downpour. But, but not that rain. I mean, the rain in a real storm comes sideways and it gets up into every crack and crevice of your house and it deteriorates things. And then you've got the floods. 
and the floods come up and the water rises during a hurricane and, and the tides come up and you've got all this going on at once. And, and anybody from the coast knows you have to have insurance for wind and you've got to have insurance for rain, you've got to have insurance for flood, and those are all different insurances. And if your house gets wiped out, the insurance companies are going to fight for three years over whose job it was to pay you off because they're all, not, they're all going to claim it wasn't their responsibility because you got all these things going on at once well that's how our life is you can't just be prepared in one area of your life you say well i got this grace thing nailed down or i got this hypocrisy thing good or, or self-righteousness i'm good there and and ignore the rest because it's all these various storms that are going to come to life and any one of them can attack you. And so Jesus is giving us here in the Sermon on the Mount kind of the comprehensive look of how our life should be structured because his laws are unbendable just like the laws of nature are unbendable. You can say, well, I don't like the laws of nature and I'm going to do my thing. And yeah, you can jump off whatever you want, but you're going to get hurt if you jump far enough. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. That's how it is. And the laws, the spiritual laws that God lays down are just as real as these physical laws of life. So, God's laws are just as unbending. This isn't serving suggestions in the Sermon on the Mount. These are the laws of how God designed us to be and how to live. And then we go on to the third takeaway from this is we must learn and we must act. You know, hearing without doing will fail. That's what our scripture says. If you hear it and you don't do it, you're going to be a failure. You're, you're a fool. Your house is going to collapse. But you know, a lot of people try to do without a hearing in the Christian life. They kind of make it up on their own. I, I kind of do my own thing of spirituality and I kind of, you know, hear from my friends or I pick it up on social media and I, I just know what's right for me and, and I just do my thing. Well, you, if you're not hearing God's word, if you're not hearing God's word, it's, it's a double uh, problem to not then be doing it. The scripture says we can't just hear God's word and ignore it or hear God's word and modify it the way we wish it was. God says this is the way it's got to be if you're going to have a successful and a fulfilling life and do all the things that I designed you to do because I love you that much that I made you in such a way that you can have a wonderful life and a meaningful life that will stand up to the tests and storms of life. So, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows. You all know the Bible. You all know what God teaches. To hear it and to not do it is just thumbing your nose in God's face. It's a dangerous way to live because you will eventually crash. It may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen for years to come, but eventually you will crash. So the fourth takeaway is this. The storms of life hit both houses. He's real clear in his scripture. The storms came on the house on the rock, and the storms came at the house on the sand. Just because you hear God's teaching and follow it doesn't mean there aren't going to be storms in life. It doesn't mean you're not going to get beat up. We're all worn out from COVID. We're overwhelmed. We're tired. We've had enough of enough from all this. And I know many of your stories and, and some of your stories are horrendous with the challenges you or your family faces and the, and the storms of life have already come to you in pretty tough ways. And for those of you who haven't had that yet, they will come. Eventually those storms of life will come. If you're built on the rock, Jesus promises. He doesn't say it's probably going to work out this way. He didn't say, hopefully it'll work out this way. He promises, if you are built on the rock, your house will stand. Doesn't mean you're not going to get rained on. Doesn't mean the flood's not going to come. Doesn't mean the winds aren't going to come in torrents. But you will stand. But he says, if you build on the sand, which means to hear his word and not do it, then you will collapse. It may take a while, it may not happen overnight, but you will collapse. Eventually, it's going to come. You know, a lot of you probably don't know, but Fitzhugh Hall, and for those of you who knew, Fitzhugh is one of the white buildings there at the, at the uh, main part of campus, that, uh, the old historic buildings. Well, Fitzhugh and Preston Hall were built 111 years ago. 
and they were built on really two different foundations. The part where you come up the big steps, that was built on a really solid foundation that goes down deep under the bedrock, and, and it, holds, it holds pretty solid and has for, for over uh, a century. The wings, the part going down the sides that kind of frame our commons and where those beautiful trees are, those were built on sand. And essentially what they did is they built a foundation and they packed it solid with sand and they built the building on top of the sand. Well, it worked. It worked for many years. But after a while, as storms came and water leaks came and the rains came, we started to get cracks in the building. And the cracks got bigger and bigger and bigger. And a number, several years ago now, maybe eight or nine years ago, we had to tear down Fitzhugh Hall. You look at it and you see it as a 111-year-old building, which is what it looks like on the outside. But on the inside, where those science labs are, it's all brand new. We tore it completely to the ground. Done. Over. Because it was going to collapse. It was so bad, the building inspector for the city of Jackson wouldn't go in and look at it. He said this building could fall down at any moment. <clears throat> When you build on sand, it may stand up for a while. It may look good for a while. You may be able to feel like, hey, I got this. I'm all under control. But eventually, your house will collapse when you're built on sand. You can see it in Preston Hall. Preston will eventually collapse. Preston will not make it long term. We have spent uh, lots of money over four different renovations to prop it up. If you look at the end of the building, there's these huge steel pipes, uh, rods that come up to hold up the building, and we've done all kinds of things to build up that foundation, make it last as long as we can. But it is built on sand, and I don't care what we do to it, I don't care how we try to fix it, it will not stand eventually. And that's how our life is. That's what Jesus is telling us. If you build on the rock, the storms are going to come, it's going to get tough, there are going to be hard times, but if you'll listen to my teaching and follow it, you'll be wise and you'll be okay. But if you build on sand, life's only got trouble ahead. That's what we're going to look at in this Sermon on the Mount in these weeks to come, and I look forward to opening that with you and exploring that. Let's say our benediction together, and then that, that code will come up on the screen for those of you who are ready to go with that. No eye has seen. No ear is heard, no mind is conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.